Okay. All righty. There you go. It says you're live. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, good morning. Welcome also to all of you joining on YouTube. Sorry, I was saying earlier that uh, I, I failed to get the YouTube um, to sign in properly on Tuesday morning. So we're going to pick up... Uh, I guess we got equal last week with Pastor Steve, and so we're going to pick up in the same exact spot, but it is Wednesday, not Tuesday. I get that. So, as we usually do, uh, would we like to start with a couple prayer requests and open up in a word of prayer? Donelda. Pray for the deliverance of all persecuted people and for their and judgment on the persecutors, all Christian people. Okay. Alrighty. Any anyone else? Yes. Betty Lou. Mm. She seemed in good spirits and moving around yesterday, so that's good. Yep. Yes. Prayers of Thanksgiving for our dear friend Pat Massey, who was just, um, he, she saw her oncologist. She's been battling stage four ovarian. She got a clean bill of health. Oh, cancer wow. is gone. Oh, good. So it's God's wow. miracle, and we're, we're so, wow. we're so grateful. That's awesome. Fantastic. Those are always great to hear. Alrighty, let's, let's head to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, yet another beautiful day that you blessed us with here down in South Florida. Uh, Lord, it's uh, just marvelous to look out and to see your beautiful creation as it continues uh, to uh, praise you. And so we, as your creation as well, continue to honor you and praise you um, every day of our lives as well. We thank you for this time that we are that we have to be gathered together and to uh, read in your word, to learn. And so we ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit be a part of our conversation. May it dwell inside of us, Lord, to open our ears and our minds to your word and to your truth, um, as it's spoken uh, both in its normal historical context, but also how it applies to even our lives today. Lord, as we are your children, you invite us and bid us to come to you in prayer and uh, and and raise our petitions to you and so we do that now lord uh, asking that you would be with all people who are being persecuted for their faith um, lord may you continue to embolden them give them strength um, in this time may they hold strong to their faith and lord we ask for there to be um, your justice in your time for those who are persecuting um, maybe in the same sense as the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road, Lord, that you would bring about a revelation uh, that they are persecuting your church. They're persecuting uh, the ones that you love and the ones that are out there to share goodness and grace and mercy and love with the world. Um, and they would have a radical change in their life. May they be um, convicted, confronted, uh, to be uh, converted from their, their, the ways of darkness, the ways of this world, into the ways of light and the ways of you, Father. We have a prayer of thanksgiving, Lord, uh, for Pat Massey and the clean bill of health from her cancer. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the way that you work in miraculous ways and even through uh, some of modern technology to heal our bodies, to restore us uh, back into full health. And in that restoration, Lord, we pray for Betty Lou. Would you please uh, be with her and her knee? And as she continues to work with PT, we ask, Lord, that you'd be a part of that healing process. We thank you for all the brothers and sisters in Christ and her family that have surrounded her um, and continue to support her and encourage her. Uh, may her, may uh, she feel that encouragement and may she continue uh, to build up that strength so she can, uh, can regain uh, some of that independence that, we, as we know her, she's longing for. Um, Lord, in all these prayers and those that are still in our hearts and minds that we lift up to you in silence, may you, uh, may you hear them, may you answer them in your timing and in your will, Lord, and to the glory of your Father in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, uh, one other piece of information uh, today, after we get finished around 11 o'clock, they, they do need to have lunch in here with the kids uh, because we have our special speaker in uh, talking about safety on internet and things like that, network, uh, 
cyber safety and things. Uh, and so if we can just, as soon as we kind of finish, we can have more conversation out in the courtyard, but they do need to have the kids here in the fellowship hall around 11, 15, 11, 20. So we have a little bit of a buffer, but we do need to make our way out to be respectful um, to the wonderful school that we have over there and the things uh, to have multiple lunches at the same time. Alrighty, so can my, I, oh, yeah, hit me. I just want to share something. I saw something on Facebook today talking about uh, blood tests for cancer. They're, they're developing something now where with a simple blood test, okay. they can determine uh, whether cancer cells are present, even when there, there are no symptoms. So okay. Way ahead of the game. Wow. And they're saying it's got a very high rate of uh, accuracy, very few false negatives, very few false positives. Okay. And so that's on, that's on the way out. They're working on it now. Okay. Early detection. That's awesome. That's the first I've seen of that. That's, that's one. Okay. We're going to keep an eye out for that. It's information for, for those who need it. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. I have our note saying that we are in Matthew 22, verse 23. Anyone have anything different? Or does that sound good to you? 34. 34. Okay. All right. So um, yesterday's group was at 22, uh, but they thought maybe they thought we were all at 34. Okay. So let's just recap then where we are. So um, what time frame of holiday or festival are we in currently? Passover. Passover. Thank you. Yes. Um, it, me jumping back from vacation and Easter and everything else, um, when I was looking back into it, I started reading directly from 2234, and it was like, okay, this is interesting, and uh, as the Bible is interesting, but it becomes a little bit more pointed when you remember that we are in Jerusalem for Passover, recognizing that Jesus having these conversations with these Jewish leaders, Sadducees, and as we get down into Pharisees, teachers of the law, lawyers, um, these are public spectacles with an enormous amount of people present and listening to these, I'm going to call them beatdowns, um, that Jesus is giving to the Sadducees and Pharisees as they try to trick him and as they try to deceive him and ask him ridiculous questions. He is continuing to outsmart them. I don't necessarily say outwit because it's not wit, it's just truth. He's just bringing God's word to them in all its truth and in its fullness and they're marveling, they're struck dumb, they're silenced because they can't ask him anything, they can't outsmart him, and yet they're not ready to either repent or um, seed and say, hey, you know what, yes, you have the right interpretation, yes, you have the right understanding of God and his word, his truth for our lives. Um, and because they won't do that, then they're again, the conflict, as we get it, is continuing to build towards that time where they say, you know what, we can't beat them, we might as well kill them can't beat them we're gonna kill them let's make the plot let's get them let's get them on a tree let's get them crucified and so um, to remember this the Sadducees are up first they're asking about the resurrection they ask a ridiculous question that is pretty much unheard of to say that a woman would go through seven brothers in one lifetime um, it's just <laughs> not heard of and still not have any children um, and then you have to remember that the Sadducees do not believe in the full resurrection because they do not believe in the prophets. They don't believe in the end times in that way. And so he's saying, so what's going to happen? Um, so they're just all going to live together. She's going to be part of them. And Jesus answers her and says, you are wrong because you know neither scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Again, we're thinking of things in this world. We're thinking of temporal things. We're not thinking of heavenly things. Heavenly times is a time to praise God and to worship God, um, to honor and serve him. It is not a time of procreation. It's not a time of binding ourselves with a spouse, but rather being bound in eternity of love and grace and mercy with our heavenly father. And so we are not given into marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And what is the responsibility of angels? Worship. Okay, worship, good. Messengers, great. Yep, that's a, that is the, uh, the definition term of the messengers and servants of God. Yes, so that becomes our role, to praise, to worship, and to continue to proclaim the good news, even if it is to our neighbors who already know the good news, but they're just happy we're all proclaiming the good news in heaven. 
So, and as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said by to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not a God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. They were astonished at his teaching, and they said, you know what? All right, Sadducees are out. Let's tap in the Pharisees. And so the Pharisees come in to have a conversation with Jesus. We pick up at 34 where you guys left off. They think they have a better question for Jesus. Number verse 4, 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I mentioned it earlier, the Sadducees um, don't follow and don't ascribe to the, um, the Navaim, which is the Hebrew writings of the prophets. Um, they uh, just look at the Torah or the Pentateuch, those first five books of Moses. And so it's interesting, even as Jesus goes into his explanation with the Pharisees, who do read both the prophets and uh, the books of Moses, um, which would also be known as the law, um, he identifies both. He identifies that these two commandments depend all what is written, all that is told, all that is conveyed in the law and in the prophets. Bringing both up to, um, up to their viewpoint. As we kind of maybe, if you remember back in like Bible study time, Bible school times, um, we had, you know, there's usually two tablets that show the Ten Commandments. And on one tablet, how many commandments? Ten. Two. Two. Nope. Three. Three. Yeah, usually, usually a lot of the depictions, we don't know how many numbers, how they numbered them on there. Uh, that, so that's to be left into interpretation. But three on one side, and those three deal with our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods above me. You shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And you shall honor the Sabbath. Those three are ways that we worship, honor um, our Heavenly Father. And so uh, that is the very that is the great commandment that Jesus that Jesus is speaking of to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Um, I guess, and as we would know from the Old Testament, and strength, but uh, all your heart, soul, and mind. That is the great commandment. Those three bringed into one is to just honor, love, serve, obey God. That is that is plain and simple. Now on the other side of it, he says the second one to just like it to love your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you would never really want to steal from yourself. You wouldn't murder yourself. You wouldn't adulter yourself. You wouldn't covet yourself. You wouldn't tell people lies about yourself, bearing false witness. And so the other seven commandments comprised into one or shrunk into one is to love your neighbor as you would want to be loved or as you would expect them to love you. And so he breaks it down. And the part also is that they asked him, which is the great, meaning one, yet Jesus technically gave them two because he knew the test that was at play. If you say you only have to love God and you don't have to love your neighbor, more or less that's heresy and that's not the way of God. The way of God was to give us into a community to love and to cherish and to take care of one another. I mean, we talk about it even today, how we, how we care and love and serve <clears throat> the brothers and sisters in the church and in the faith and our neighbors even outside of the church as God gives us um, abilities to be good stewards um, to those around us. And so he sees past their question, he sees into um, their deceit and the way that they're trying to trick him to answer both sides at the exact same time and not give them a chance to worm in an excuse or to say, oh, you've forgotten about, no, I didn't forget about anybody. You love God first. That is your number one priority. That's our number one calling as children of God. Love, serve, obey God with everything we have. Second, love your neighbor. Out of the love that God has already showed you, out of the love that you've learned from God, you now turn and show that same love to your neighbor. 
just as you would imagine or hope and, and pray that they would do to you. Questions on on that? In the back. Yep. If, if, a, if soldiers are in a war and uh, the Sabbath day comes, what are they to do? So are you um, you talking like today? Well, let's just say there's the day is the Sabbath and soldiers... You know, they're in a battle. They can't take the day off if the enemy is coming at them. So it, who's in control? Violation or God makes a provision understanding that. So who's who's in control of the Sabbath? Who's Lord of the Sabbath? Yahweh is. Jesus. Jesus said, yes, yeah, so Yahweh in the Old Testament, and Jesus yeah. comes and says, yes, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. And so Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath, what did he, what did he reinstate? At the in his death and resurrection. Yeah. So the Sabbath. I mean, because again, if you're talking Old Testament, then the Sabbath technically would be Saturday. But if you're talking New Testament, then we consider, and we most of us consider Sabbath on Sunday. But then, if we only consider the Sabbath to be on Sunday, why do we offer Monday services and Saturday night services <laughs> if if everyone needs to observe the Sabbath on Sunday? Well, okay, we're a smart church, yeah. Um, so, so the this is this is where. Say, say again. Sabbath was made for man. Yes, yes. God, God showed us how to take rest, but take rest and refuge in God in that time frame. And so, the idea behind the Sabbath, and this is where sometimes we get legalistic about it this side of the cross as we say okay well church needs to be on sunday because jesus rose on sunday and so that's the only sabbath and you have to take the okay what is the purpose of the sabbath the purpose of the sabbath is an opportunity to worship to find rest in our savior and to find that time of rejuvenation in his word and with his people so if you find that on saturday evening then you've observed the sabbath if you have found that um, throughout Sunday morning and on Sunday, then that's great. If you have to, if you're a weekend worker, because that's your job, then you know what? You find that church service that's on Sunday, or sorry, not Sunday, Monday, or even some churches offer services every week on Wednesday, and you have your Wednesday Sabbath. So it's important to still find what that day of your Sabbath is and to still take that time, but that time is not a, does not define a 24 hour period anymore. It does not define um, a specific legalistic way to observe it as much as it is the idea behind time with God and time with his community, a time of rest for our bodies. The soldiers will continue fighting until they got that time to devote their Sabbath. Yep, that's what I would say. Yeah, and also, um, if, if I was a soldier, and I know from my brother-in-law, uh, he kept the Bible pretty close when in war times. So he was he was spending he was spending time probably more so uh, when there was when there was those breaks and those times. Uh, What's to, that statement that there's no atheists in the war? There's no atheist in a foxhole. Yeah, yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 That's that that is one of the jokes and comments. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you know, again, he gets to be a living testament of his faith uh, when he was in the military. So it's it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing in that way. Um, but it's sad that it takes such dire circumstances for some people to recognize. Where, where do you find the most sinners? In this room? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, everywhere. <laughs> like, I mean, we're all sinners. I don't, I don't, I mean, no offense to you guys. It could be me, really, but, but. Well, the answer's in church or in this room. Okay, there you go. See, I was right. I knew, I knew the question. There you go. Yeah, no, and sinners, uh, we're all sinners. We all need a doctor, um, and the church is not perfect. And so we, we need God to be a part of the church, and praise be to God that he is the head of the church. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to see him lead this church um, here at St. Paul and do the, the wonderful things that he does inside this community. Other questions on loving our neighbors? Nope? Okay. So, great commandment. Love God, love our neighbors. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying to them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, or by the Spirit, calls him Lord? Saying, and this is a quote back 
uh, into the Old Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. <laughs> Jesus' authority is questioned, and he proves it through their own language of Old Testament interpretation that the Messiah is just not merely a human, but he is also divine. Um, some people will accept his humanity, but that's all they'll acknowledge, while others acknowledge both his humanity and his act of being both Savior and God, and that's certain is hope for salvation. As we look into um, that psalm time, I don't want to skip through it. Let's see. Um, there you go, Psalms 110. Um, if you flip in your Bible to Psalms 110.1. Psalms 110.1. There's a key feature here. Um, that is that is somewhat missed in the Greek. Um, if someone has a King James Bible, yours probably is uh, looks a little bit different. Alrighty. So what is uh, someone want to read out what their Bible says out loud? One ten one in Psalms. Okay. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay, very good. Okay, what about capitalization in your Bible for 110? Are any of those lords look different than other lords? All uppercase. Uppercase? On the first lord? Yeah. So what do we know that all uppercase lord means? Yahweh. Means Yahweh. Yep. All uppercase lord means Yahweh. Um, scriptures and some uh, interpreters do not like to uh, put in their translation the name of God because it is to be. It's, it's a reverence thing. Uh, they don't like to write out Yahweh. Uh, some of my teachers at the seminary uh, give us permission and say that they prefer uh, translations that say Yahweh because then you know who you're talking about. It's not Lord Jesus, not Lord Master, but it's Yahweh. I mean, it is Lord of Lords, the highest, you know. And so um, Yahweh is the name that God gave to his people. Um, and we are to use it with respect, but it is a name that he's given us to use and to know him by, um, Old Testament and New Testament. And so uh, the translation factor that gets kind of changed, if you have a word-by-word -word translation, or, um, is that in the Greek, this, uh, what was said was kurios, and so that does mean Lord, and then it's kuriu, kurios, or kurios, kuriu, um, I forget which one comes first, but it's just changing the endings, which says what part of speech it's in, but it's Lord um, says to my Lord. And so we lose the fact that this is Yahweh saying to my Lord. So you said the first one's all caps, right? Okay, so it says Yahweh says to my, and then is it still uppercase for L? Uppercase L, but the rest is lowercase. Okay, so this is still David speaking so he says Yahweh says to me David my Lord who would be David's Lord Yahweh okay that's the first one yep but if Yahweh is not talking to Yahweh what would be the second Lord Messiah. Jesus the Messiah Jesus is yeah pronounced Yeshua? Uh, in the Greek pronunciation yes but we know it English probably better as Jesus so, but this would be him in the spirit, and so that's what Jesus is saying here. This is a prophecy. This is pro. This is prophetic to say that um, this is not saying again to someone below him as King David, not below, but someone above King David in the nation of Israel at that time. It'd have to be God's own son. It'd have to be someone that fits underneath Yahweh and above, above King David, and that's Jesus. And so he's saying the Lord says to Jesus sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Who is the enemies of Jesus? Pharisees. Okay, the Pharisees on earth, sure. Who, who's, who's the bigger enemy? Satan. 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 What do we hear from Genesis chapter 3? Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, the promise. Down in the dirt you go. 
You will strike his head and he will bruise your heel. We, this, this is a recounting of Jesus' death and resurrection, the resurrection that is victory over sin, death, the power of the devil, all the enemies of humanity. And Jesus will sit at the right hand of God and he will put the enemy underneath himself, yeah. which is a sign of victory. Yeah. Sure, the in the back. The heel part you just said have to do with the, the, the battle between us and, and uh, Satan? No, that's the, that's the death. That's the death of Jesus is just a bruise. The resurrection is the full defeat of the enemy. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yep. And so this is, this is calling back to the victory that we have in Christ. This is calling back to the victory that we have, that Jesus sits at the right hand victorious with the devil as a footstool underneath his foot. I mean, the, the mafia F references could go on and on. He's got his pressure on his throat, yada, 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 whatever you want to say. But Jesus has won. Jesus has won. And so this is what uh, we can go back to Matthew. But this is what he's calling these Pharisees to. As they are here, and they are, he's asking them these questions. What is Christ? Oh, yeah, we know who Christ is. He's going to be the son of David. Okay, if he's just the son of David, if he's just from the line, if he's just a mere man, why would King David show such reverence to him in his writings through the Spirit to say what the future holds? What the future holds for Jesus to sit at the right hand of God and have the devil underneath his feet. Have him underneath his own control. Because Jesus is victor victorious, he is victor, and he will come and reign forever and ever. And at this, they have nothing to answer him, and so they don't ask any more questions. <laughs> Again, I kind of mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, this time, this Passover time, people are around. This is a public spectacle as Jesus is answering these questions and refuting these, uh, these false teachings and bringing in full understanding of God's word. People are in awe. And now they're saying, we're getting beat left and right. There's nothing more to say out in public. Time to save face and leave him alone. Leave him alone until we can find a way to get him completely out of the picture. Questions. I know they don't have questions. But what questions might you have? <laughs> I'm sure. Yep. So when David wrote Psalm 110, Mm-hmm. But it was actually the Holy Spirit guided him to do it, right? There's a good discussion point to say all the scripture oh. is written by the Holy Spirit. It's inspired, inspired by God. So the Holy Spirit's Jesus a part of all of it. A, Jesus had a lot of respect for that then, in what we're talking about. I mean, yes. Because you went but, back to Psalm 110, we were talking about Matthew uh, chapter 22, verse, what was it, 37? Or 44, no, but Jesus brings it back. He brings it back. Jesus knows the scriptures. He was raised in the Jewish tradition along with the fact that he's the son of God, the incarnate word. So to how much of it was completely learned and, and from youth, but also the fact that he's perfect and got a chance to be in God's word and was in community with God. He knew his word. He knew, he knew his father's words front and back. And so that's, the, that's, the, that's what the discussion is all about, is that he uses David's words the words of the Old Testament that the Pharisees would know, that the Pharisees trust. It's not him bringing a new teaching. There's times when he talks to Greeks and they bring up kind of a, the, the interpretation in new words. But when he talks to people from the Pharisees or the Sadducees, he brings up things they know. He brings it up either from the prophets or he brings it up from the Torah. So they exactly know what he's talking about. You've studied this. You know these words are true. It's not my words. These are God's words that you trust and you've taught for years, but you don't know what they mean. You don't believe. You're not seeing the signs that are in front of you. You're not seeing the prophecies that have been fulfilled right in front of your eyes. Listen again. And instead of listening and being convicted and believing and being moved towards repentance, they listen, they harden their hearts, and they walk away with a plan to try to destroy him. And so, again, when Jesus talks about those who have ears, let them hear, let them hear. But those who turn off their ears, they will never hear. And so the kingdom of God is coming in. They're being met with the kingdom of God. And there's two options. You either accept it and repent, or you reject it and you're in opposition. And they're choosing opposition. Yes? Uh, when, uh, when they see prophecy being fulfilled and they don't go along with it, 
it's a, it's a huge problem for them. Yep. Which is the whole entire conversation that we had mm, two and a half weeks ago, um, or two weeks ago, uh -huh. three, with, with the whole conversation of um, where did the baptism of John the Baptist come from? Is that from God or is that from man? You've been told about this. You've been told that there would be another one that would come and proclaim the way, make way for the Messiah. And here that's what John the Baptist did, but you rejected him. You rejected the kingdom of God coming to you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit being upon you, and you walked away from it, and you're just saying, well, we're waiting for Elijah. Well, Elijah's already come. Elijah's already been here. Elijah prepared the way in the time when Israel and the southern kingdom were uh, turning away from God and were worshiping Baal or Baal and Asherah poles and all kinds of bad stuff. And Elijah came and proclaimed the way of repentance. And that's exactly what John was doing. And so he's like, you didn't believe him. If you don't believe him, you're definitely not going to believe me. And so the signs have been fulfilled time and time and time again. Have you not heard it said? And I say, you know, and so that's, that's the problem. That's the rub that we're at right now where the friction is coming from. Is they're holding on to their old traditions. They're holding on to their old words without recognizing what it means and the prophecies that are being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and in the work that he's doing. And for that he had some right between the eyes two weeks ago. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you, you wicked tenants. It will be given to the prostitutes and the tax collectors because they understand the kingdom of God and they love me. They love the Father. They love the one who owns the vineyard. They're happy to work in the vineyard. And so it's all accumulating now. I mean, we are in a big crescendo buildup towards the passion, towards the crucifixion. Yep. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering yes, where they got the idea that the Messiah was it the idea that the Messiah was going to save them from the Romans or that Jesus was going to save them from the Romans because they didn't fully believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay. If Jesus was the Messiah, he would be saving them from the Romans. That's the okay. sign they were waiting okay. for. Yeah. That's what they were looking for. Yeah. They were looking for a, uh, a, a temporal and an earthly victor right. versus the spiritual and heavenly eternal victor okay. that we know and love and, and trust in Jesus for. So but, that's what they wanted. So that was their idea of the Messiah. Yep. And so they... If, if the Messiah was going to be the son of David, it wasn't just a promise of a covenant and a line, but it was also the promise of a new king. But their king was going to be an earthly king. Their king was going to bring them back to power and authority, um, back to their uh, the golden age, as it's written throughout Scripture in that time of David and Solomon. I mean, that it's just time of prosperity and wealth and trade and riches in the temple. The temple restored to its glory, um, but they never recognized the temple was no longer a building but a man yeah. and the band was going the temple was going to be destroyed and it would be rebuilt in three days and they thought that would be their earthly temple not the temple of where worship was and it would be centered on jesus to the father yeah so that's 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 what they if he would have came in, uh, again it wouldn't have been god's plan and it wouldn't be uh wouldn't have been to the fulfillment that we need because it would have been temporal, not eternal. But yeah, if Jesus would have rode in and took over the Romans, I think I think the Jews might have. I mean, it's a ton of um, uh, perspection, not perspection. Um, I'll get the other right word. I'm just guessing. I'm just mm -hmm. guessing. I guess that's the right word. I'm just taking an educated guess that, yeah, if they saw him come in, white horse, and take over Jerusalem... Oh my goodness, for a cult time, they would have definitely believed. But if he would have never continued to conquer all of Rome, then they would have, they would have faltered at that point. And so, it, again, but his, his mind and God's mind, thank goodness, is not on what's in this world, but is on what's in heaven. And that's, that's the problem. That's what they can't wrap their mind around is how do I get out of our legalism and our toting the line and, um, and the aspects of what's in this world to see the things of God. And that's what Jesus came, is to bring the kingdom of God. So there's nowhere in Scripture that says that the Messiah was going to save them from the Roman people. Correct. Or do all these things that they thought. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe that just closed their minds. 
this was the vision they had, mm -hmm. and it closed their minds from what Scripture was saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. their the, their image of what, and I get uh, I. I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to not be fair. There's tons of freedom language throughout the prophets. The Messiah that will set us free. The Messiah that will uh, bring about justice. The Messiah that will bring about, um, uh, yes, an abundance and, and prosperity. But prosperity in what? Yeah. Prosperity in, in the spiritual fruit. Joy and peace and love. Um, what, what, is, what is it going to look like to have that freedom? Freedom from sin. Freedom from the law. Um, that's part of uh, a little bit of my sermon that I, if I had an extra 15 minutes, I would have dove more into. But um, when you talk about Jesus being that person of peace, um, we don't always look at it in the Old Testament that there was the, the law and the sacrificial system was the appeasement. I mean, again, as you hear all these sacrifices being burnt, and it was the sweet aroma rose to the Lord, and it was it was pleasing to his nostrils. And um, But those sacrifices, those blood sacrifices were necessary to appease that relationship of sin of the people and a just heavenly father, a righteous heavenly father. And so Jesus came as the one sacrifice to free us from a lifetime of animal sacrifices or blood sacrifices to atone for us, and he atoned for our sin. So where's our freedom? Our freedom's from the law. Our freedom's from works that we think we have to be good enough because Jesus already was good enough. The freedom is from the oppression of the devil and from Satan and from uh, his minions because now we have the Holy Spirit that abides in us, that prays on our behalf, that fights the battles for us, that protects us um, from getting snuck up on and brings about that clarity of God's word and scripture to open our minds to understand it through faith. Um, that's the freedom. The slavery is now, it's not a slavery of, okay, yeah, we have a Roman government over top of us. The slavery is there's an evil one out there looking to devour us mm -hmm. and has us trapped in chains of sin and temptation. And now we have a heavenly father that releases us from that. We have Jesus who has cut those chains and has made us free in him. Not that we're going to be perfect, not that we're going to be sinless. I think we all know that. Um, but that's a moment where the spirit continues to bid us back into repentance instead of us being sin stuck in our sin dwelling in our sin and continuing to sin the spirit comes and bids us back and comes and brings us back into that moment in those times of repentance and recognizing the sacrifice that we have for us that allows for us to overcome and that's the beauty of it that's the freedom but they wanted they wanted their freedom and their comfort and their space and their system and their legalism. And it clouded. Yeah, absolutely clouded. That was a good point. <coughs> Let, I'm just letting it sit for a second. There's a lot going, there's a lot being talked yeah. about. Go ahead. Uh, in those days, the whole, some people that listened and followed Jesus and not, not, um, the other way was that maybe the Holy Spirit was working the same way today. Oh, absolutely. Holy Spirit. Absolutely. The Spirit opens ears to hear and it, it plants the seed. It continues to nourish the seed. I mean, that's that's the writings of Paul as the gospel went out and the seeds are planted. Seeds are scattered as Jesus is preaching and teaching his message in parables. Um, but it's the continual water and care of the Holy Spirit and also, yes, of us around to encourage one another, to continue to be a witness, to be a reaffirmation for people. Um, is, yeah, is what grew the, the faith in the early Christian church, grew the faith in disciples. Um, again, if you want one more proof text, you have Peter's confession that we talked about, where Jesus says, this did not come from you, but rather came from my Father above, through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, absolutely. And so the Holy Spirit is at work through them continuing to grow and to foster faith in those people. Um, but you can also... And again, not want to get to the eternal sin aspect, but you can reject the Holy Spirit. And you can reject the work that it brings you and prompts you to do. And that's where the Pharisees and the Sadducees are right now. The Holy Spirit is, is at work. And they're saying, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want to change. I don't want to have to give up my position. I don't want to give up my prominence. Um, as it was talked about, uh, actually, it will be talked about as we go down, so decent segue, scribes and Pharisees. Hey, I don't want to give up my prominence at the table. I don't want to give up my power and authority I have with people um, to follow another rabbi. No, no, I'm, 
I know enough. I'm leader here. We know enough. It's it, there's that's where the contention comes in. Yes. I think they saw him do the miracle. Ah, yeah. <laughs> they listened to what he had to say, mm -hmm. and they could still reject him. Yeah. It, it's really unbelievable. <laughs> it, it stinks. Yeah. I, I'm just going to put it that way. It stinks. Um, conversation on Tuesday and a conversation also in one of my religion classes just came up of transformation and uh, G, through Jesus' transfiguration. But um, through this text is, okay, so um, what about uh, what about our Jewish brothers and sisters? And so, you know what? They, they know the Old Testament well. They're, they're faithful believers in God, but they don't recognize Jesus what does that mean for them? And it's just, it is the most unfortunate thing to say is that they are right there. But Jesus clearly states in scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. And if they don't know who Jesus is as the Son of God, if they don't know about his sacrifice, and they don't know about his forgiveness, the sins, for the resurrection, uh, through the resurrection and the new life they have in him, eternal life is not theirs. Well, they also don't think he was Jewish. Many of them don't understand that he was Jewish, you know? mm. um, and just yeah. I Jewish or anything else, Savior, Son of God. You, I, I need you to have that part. You know, that's that's the part that we cling to, um, and so that is uh, that that is tough. And so you yeah, know, I mean, that simple fact has escaped from some of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. It's not surprising that that's escaped from too. Right, right. And like I said to my sixth graders, um, it is it is sad, it is unfortunate, and it is something that we, um, in my opinion, should take every effort we get a chance to to continue to encourage, continue to witness, continue to pray for, um, for them, because it, I don't know what spark they need, what moment of truth they need, um, but my goodness, to have that much understanding of the Old Testament and then see it through Jesus, ah, oh, that's incredible. We do, we do a lot of good um, New Testament study, but once you can get into some of the Old Testament, you see what's being promised years and years in advance for the Messiah, it makes your mind just explode with how many prophecies are fulfilled or how much um, truth is in God's, uh, Jesus' words and in his parables because it speaks, I mean, like we bounce back in the parable right there back to Isaiah. Like, they know that. <laughs> and yet, he has a whole parable and they still don't get it. Points right at him. And they still don't get it. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but we have the Bible now. We have the whole gospel message. We have the whole story, and people still don't believe. So I, I don't want to, I know they're dead, but I don't want to kick them while they're down, no pun intended. You know, it, they, they unfortunately had a, a part in God's story, um, and that was the part of to crucify Jesus. And unfortunately, uh, as that was, but how fortunate for us, because it was part of God's plan. And through his sacrifice, all are healed, and through his sacrifice, all are saved, who come to the glory and the knowledge of Jesus. Caveat. So. All right, let's jump into 23. I think we got to verse, like, 16 or something like that. Um, so... We can go further if we want to than uh, the Tuesday group. Otherwise, we can stay about equal uh, and continue to ask questions. There's nothing wrong with that. Seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Okay, what is Moses' seat? Let's take a quick break. Law. The law. There you go. Wow, you guys were great. Boom, boom. Nice. Uh, yes, the law. So do and observe whatever they tell you. The law being the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the, the Torah. Um, we, here at St. Paul and in the majority of Christian churches, we do not toss out the Old Testament. Just because Jesus is here does not mean that everything that God did before Jesus is null. Um, yes, we don't need the sacrificial system anymore because Jesus paid the sacrifice, but there is still incredibly great teaching and testaments of faith and of fortitude in faith um, that we learn from the forefathers, from uh, Isaac and Jacob and Abraham and Moses and David. Uh, we also are warned of some of the downfalls of people like Solomon and some of the uh, Samson. 
uh, where they let their own power and their recklessness get into their mind and pollute, uh, pollute their thoughts as they were called into a purpose for God. So don't, don't throw away the history. Don't throw away the truth that is in there. Continue to listen. Continue to observe, but not the works they do. Keep an eye of discernment. Keep a heart and a spirit of discernment for the works they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. This being uh, those burdens of... um, uh, Sorry, I'm drawing a blank on what I wanted to say. Um, Our term probably would be more like penance. And so the, the burdens of trying to do enough good works to outweigh your sin. Enough sacrifices to appease what you've done wrong. Rather than looking towards God and Jesus as the Messiah um, that takes away that burden. And so they lay these burdens on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. They do not shepherd. They do not uh, lead them around. They do not help. They do not assist Whereas Jesus says, uh, pick up my yoke. A yoke is usually carried um, by two oxen at least, um, for it is light. Jesus bears that yoke with us as we go forth. Um, Here, the Pharisees do not put into practice. They do not help. They do not assist their fellow brothers and sisters. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their uh, philosophies broad, and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues. I think he's talking about Lutherans too in church sometimes. Uh, So you can laugh. And greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. They enjoy the honor. They enjoy the accolades. They enjoy being visible and being seen to be holy men, to be recognized and to be honored with that term rabbi. But where does that all come from? Selfishness, pride, insideness, looking at oneself, not looking at those outside of themselves. So Jesus says, but you are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father. Uh, My translation capitalizes that to a capital F, who is in heaven. So that's pretty simple to say. You have your heavenly father. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus continuing to bring forth the flipping of the script as we see in the kingdom of God, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. If any one of you wants to be great, you must serve all. If any one of you wants to be the best, you must lay down your life for your neighbor. You must be a slave to all, I think is actually how the text goes in that one. It's a flipping of where their minds are, of what the people there, as we were talking earlier, what the Pharisees had in their mind of of being the rulers and authority, being the, the next echelon from the top. And that's what they wanted the Messiah to do, is to raise them up and to raise back up Jerusalem and the Hebrews. And he's saying that's not how the kingdom of God works. It's not about uh, prestige and honor and pride and selfishness, but rather it's about selflessness. It's about being a servant, and serving, and loving, care, caring for those around you, humbling yourself, bringing yourself lowly underneath someone else and their needs. And all the disciples said, that's great, like, sign me up. Um, more or less. They've been doing it for a while now. And, and they'll, they'll definitely get to that humility aspect in the very near future. Verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. All right, let's talk about this for a second. Shutting the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. What do you think that means? What does that bring to your mind? Not putting God first, okay. How would they shut the kingdom of God? Who brings the kingdom of God? Messiah. The Messiah. Yep. What have they done to the Messiah? Killed him. Not yet, no. but they will. Good. <laughs> Way to think ahead. But say again. They rejected, him. they rejected him. They've rejected him. They've pushed him out. Been chased out at times. They have preached or they have taught against him. They're closing people off from the kingdom of God, from the kingdom of heaven that's coming to them, that is pursuing them, and they're in the way. Well, and all the new and man-made rules that they've tacked on probably make people feel like they're getting to heaven. Mm -hmm. They can't do everything that they yeah. want me to do. Some of the legalism as well has cut off from the grace and the understanding of who God is, his real character. Um, uh, to this, uh, the parable of the talents when the one man gets one talent he says i know you're a hard man everything you do prospers you don't know who the father is you don't know his grace his generosity that he has the fact that he would give you again that one talent to our correlations like a million dollars like he gave him a million dollars and said use this for a time while i'm gone and he did not use the gifts and the grace that was given and bestowed to him Unlike the other two who used the five talents, the two talents, and they doubled. They were prosperous. They knew the Father's heart. They knew that putting in that work of the gospel, that's what the talents represent. It's the gospel message. Um, going out and, and performing that and to use, utilize it was going to bring a reward. The reward of there being more people who had the gospel. And so he's saying that they have shut off um, the kingdom of God. Also, what is, uh, how else do we, we started this in chapter, well, we started chapter one, but chapter five starts. Pure in spirit. Pure in spirit, the humble, the meek. So if you have the Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law that are constantly trying to puff up and are constantly trying to, to raise themselves into higher positions, do we think um, that they're recognizing where uh, the kingdom of God comes? And if that's the model, if that's the example, if everyone said, okay, well, that's what they're doing, and those are the holy men, and so we're going to follow them, they're not reaching towards the kingdom of heaven. They're reaching towards prestige, honor, and authority on earth. And so there's a lot of, as we go through these woes, there's going to be um, some mimicking back and forth where Jesus started out by teaching how you receive the kingdom of God, how the kingdom of God and the blessings of God come to you. But as it continues on into now these woes, we're seeing how the blessings of God have been removed, have been revoked, or are not being received because people are not looking in the right places. Uh, and to bring it back into full view, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in spirit, uh, for they shall see God. I don't know what just happened. I'm jumping back into the Beatitudes just to remind us what they were. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, not a life of easy breezy, but those who are persecuted. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. On my account, on the account of Jesus and his gospel, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you.
the promises, the blessings that come upon those who follow Jesus. Uh, pick it back up in verse 13. Bless, uh, again, but woe to you, Fer scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. We discussed how that, how they do so. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single, uh, sorry, a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself all right jesus you got a little bit ugh, rough there all right what does that mean a child of hell what is what is that we right there okay this will be our last verse then perfect then we'll pick up we'll pick up at 16 um but work with me real quick on child of hell and then i'll let then we'll then we'll all go Someone just like the Pharisees. Someone just like the Pharisees, yeah. So what is so hell versus heaven, light versus dark, um, with the opposite of heaven then being hell, meaning that hell is in opposition to heaven. So not saying that they're going to become next the spawn of demons and stuff like that, but it is the speaking of saying as they go out, and as and again, this is kind of where it gets a little bit tough to say, but as the Jewish tradition and as the, um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees continue to teach and raise in their traditions and in puffing oneself up um, with, uh, with the legalism that is in their eyes the way to faith, they actually, instead of creating disciples as Jesus is, they're creating opposition to the gospel and they are creating children that will not be in the kingdom of heaven, children of hell. Okay. Well, that was a little bit dark, but Jesus loves you. Go in peace. <laughs> Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. There you go. Thanks be to God. We're not children of hell. There we go. Have a blessed day.